thank you for coming. Uh, sort of a side question, how many of you guys read science fiction? Oh, no, that's awesome, because science fiction was really, really important to me when I was your age and gave me a lot of ideas that actually helped me do what, what, what I'm doing right now. Uh, science fiction is interesting because it is one aspect of humanity that is so much more important than just the five senses. You know what the five senses are. Hearing, touch, smell, sight, but anyway. All of those are really cool, they all have their charms, but the broadest bandwidth is your imagination. And imagination is not something that is something uh, limited to modern humans. Uh, 30,000 years ago, humans were wandering around North uh, Europe, and these were not uncivilized behemoths that were making graffiti on stone walls. These were intelligent people, very similar in intelligence to you and I, and in their infinite spare time, they did something quite remarkable. They invented visual communication. They had an idea that they could create from what their ardent observations were of nature, replicas of the animals on which they depended to live and on which they depended to avoid. The most amazing thing was that these people not only had the idea that they could put these uh, images on the cave walls, but they had to invent the idea of creating contour and line and color, and they had to all do it in the dark, lit by a fire, because no sun entered these caves. One of the most amazing aspects of the cave drawings in the Chavo Pontarc in southern France was the uh, image that is in the right-hand side of this picture. Can anybody tell me what that is? That's a rhinoceros right up there. That's a rhinoceros with many horns. The many horns don't depict a rhinoceros with many horns. What they depict is a rhinoceros charging. It's a warning. It's the first animation 30,000 years ago. So these are people who not only invented visual communication, but they invented a means for creating the concept of motion in still art which is absolutely amazing. Now, I make my living and have been for some three and a half decades uh, using art, using drawings to communicate science, to communicate surgery. And I got a degree in medical illustration, uh, did some master's work in anatomy, and dabbled a little bit in medical school. Uh, I got diverted a little bit, however. When I was 10 years old, I had the great privilege of uh, traveling through southern France and saw the caves of Lascaux very similar paintings to these, and they inspired me. They inspired me not only to view nature as something amazing, but they inspired me to want to be an artist. Uh, I had already been drawing. My father was a sculptor and an art teacher, and when I was four years old, I saw Fantasia. And Fantasia just blew my mind and made me want to be an animator. And so at four years old, I began doing little flip book animations and thought that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Where science fiction comes in is that when I was 16 years old, I read The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Robert Heinlein. And that book taught me that I would someday be doing my animations using computers. Now this was four years before Nolan Bushnell came up with Pong, so I had a long way to wait before the technology caught up with what I wanted to do. So I did this very much akin to my forebears, my cousins in the caves. I did line art. I used a quill pen stuck in ink and did my drawings of dissections of anatomy, of surgeries. But what I really, really wanted to do was I wanted to see these things move. I, I wasn't really content with, with taking pictures of things that could move, if you could imagine it. I wanted to get into computers. And so when I was the senior medical illustrator at the Yale School of Medicine, I approached my bosses and I said, well, why don't we get into the 20th century, or at least the late part of the 20th century, and get involved in computer animation? And the response from the dean was, there is no room in medicine for cartoons. So this was really interesting, so, uh, so I quit. I quit my job at Yale and started the first digital medical animation company in the world. 
And one of the things that's the hallmark of doing something that's a little bit different and doing something that things that people don't necessarily imagine is that you run the risk of people who care about you, people who mentor you, people who want to protect you from yourself, from telling you it's not possible. I mean, Jack, I'm sure, ran into this on more than one occasion. There are people who have the idea that if they can't imagine what's in your head, then it's not possible to do. And what I want to tell all of you is that many among you will come up with ideas that you think are amazing, that you can tell in your heart from the clarity of your imagination is going to be real and important and doable. And don't let people whose imaginations prevent them from seeing it invalidate your ideas. Go for it and tell them to either support you or get out of the way. So what I did is I started my first, the first digital medical animation company in the world. This is some of my artwork. And I can tell you that it was exhilarating to actually begin to see stuff in color, because I had worked in black and white for years and years and years, but I still wanted to see something in motion. I wanted to see this capillary grow a branch. There's so many things that you can do with your life when you take your imagination and you make it real. So one of the things that I've done is to take other aspects of what I've learned from reading science fiction, like when I read uh, Neil Stevenson's book, uh, The Diamond Age, and I thought, boy, this would be so cool to be able to do interactive books like this little girl in the book was able to do. But that was back in 1995. So that was, again, a long time before the technology was available to do it. But I kept my nose to the grindstone. I did my work. I did animations for a lot of really cool companies, including Harvard. And Harvard was the, the organization that uh, hired me to do the inner lives of the cell. And one of the things that was really cool about the inner lives of the cell is that it took animation from the point of view of making up shapes for molecules. And instead of making up shapes for molecules, we took the data from the US government's project to take uh, proteins and x-ray diffract them and create actual models of where every atom was. And we figured out how to take those uh, models of, of molecules and create animations of viruses, of how things work in the cell. And so we created a new visual vocabulary of medical and scientific animation that before that had never been done. So it's really a question of, of taking what's in your head and working really hard. Now, I didn't say that by doing what you believe in and what you dream about is easy. It's the hardest thing that I ever did. And uh, I didn't realize that between leaving uh, Yale and actually earning money in my animation would take 12 years. Fortunately, I have a wonderful wife who believes in me and had a job. <laughs> so it's one of those things where the whole idea of creativity whether it's in science, whether it's in the arts, whether it's any other uh, field you end up going into, is so very important because that's where our progress comes from in our civilization, where you find something that has a need, you find something that can be solved, and you go ahead and do it. It's so very important. So one of the things that I'm doing now is taking the animations that I've done for years and years and years and I'm making them into interactive games. I'm making them into interactive apps for medical students and nursing students so that they may find a different way of learning the science. This is a, a, a single still image from the inner life of the cell. This is a kinesin. This is the little FedEx carrier inside your cells that crawls along and carries a big parcel behind him. So you've each got about 10,000 to 100,000 of these very busy little nanomotors in every cell in your body. So the next time your parents say you're being lazy, just remind them of all your busy little kinesins. <laughs> so the thing that's really important about the imagination and the thing that's really important about believing in yourself is that it's often a team effort. And if you can bring your peers and your parents and your mentors along with the ride, you can have a really, really enriching experience because what's going to happen is that as you succeed 
And as you build up a vocabulary for whatever it is you're trying to do, you're going to become introduced to people you never would have met any other way. You're going to be introduced to people who would never, on a normal day, return your phone calls. And these people will become your mentors and your teachers and your biggest boosters. And they will enable you to really find out what it is to be alive, to be human, to contribute, and to make this a better world. So this is a compendium my team did uh, just to give a sense of some of the complexity over the years. But one of the most interesting things that I find in doing this kind of work and relating it to those cave paintings of 30,000 years ago is that I'm sure that everybody looking at those cave paintings has the same neurons and same emotions tickled in their brain that tickled the brains of our forebears 30,000 years ago. And one of the dreams that I have for the new visual vocabularies that my team is creating for medical and science education is that people sometime way down the road will look at our work and find the same kind of kinship in our efforts that I find when looking at the caves of Chavo Pantark from 30,000 years ago and recognize a timeless kin. And I think that that's so very important because we're all human and we all need to support each other to move our world and our civilization forward. Thank you very much.